Good morning from our world headquarters in New York. I'm Danny Berger. Manish Cranny is off today. Welcome to Bloomberg Brief. Let's set your agenda. Another spike in U.S. yields as a hawkish Powell sends the front end to 5%. So we've said at the FOMC that we'll need greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2% before it would be appropriate to ease policy. You know, we took that cautious approach and uh, sought that greater confidence so as not to overreact to the string of low inflation readings that we had in the second half of last year. Chip machine giant ASML plunges after first quarter orders disappoint. And earnings season ramps up as Wall Street battles rate jitters and geopolitical risk. What is stability? Finally, finally calm this morning after three days of selling. Selling in both this bond market and this equity market. We are backing off of a five-month high this morning. But don't be fooled. We are up 44 basis points so far this month. Fed futures are now pricing 40 basis points of cuts. That is the lowest of the cycle. But yields down by 2.5 basis points this morning, still at 4.6%. It is a narrative shift with Powell and Jefferson yesterday talking about higher for longer, not yet the confidence to cut. Sterling gains this morning up a third of 1%. Cable trades at 124. We had inflation coming from the UK today, coming in at 3.2%. Estimate was for 3.1%, higher than expected, means stronger sterling. Though Bailey yesterday talking about the confidence to cut before the Fed. Finally, S&P 500 futures also taking a break from three days of selling, up two tenths of 1%. But as a whole, We are no means de-risking wholesale, but it has been a tough run over the past month so far. Okay, let's get to some breaking news that are just crossing the terminal. Biden is calling for higher tariffs on China steel and aluminum. He is urging higher levies when it comes to a review of Section 301 tariffs. U.S. trade representatives are now launching a probe of China's shipbuilding industry. All of this is part of the steps to woo workers in this year's election. He is visiting Pittsburgh on Wednesday and he's going to be, be proposing these new 25 percent tariffs on certain Chinese steel and aluminum products as an ongoing review. There's aluminum priced LME not moving too much down two tenths of one percent. Little change from where it was before these breaking headlines. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Rebecca Chung Wilkins on this breaking news. Rebecca, you're in Hong Kong from a Beijing perspective. How concerning are these new tariffs from Biden? Well, this excellent reporting from my colleague Danny suggests that actually it's a relatively small segment of the U.S. market that is going to be affected by this. So the equivalent of about 1.7 billion U.S. dollars uh, last year. And that's in line with this notion of the small yard, high fence approach that the Biden administration has taken so far. But the absolute numbers aside, I think this development is emblematic of the broader concern that Beijing has here, which is that as we get closer to the election, increasing the areas of Chinese trade in China are going to be deeply politicized and it does not look like that momentum is kind of pulling pulled back in any way and that more and more areas of trade will find itself of Chinese trade specifically imports into the US will find itself the target of these types of curbs and tariffs and I would also say from Beijing's perspective it underscores the importance when it comes to building these other sort of relatively uh, better ties uh, with European nations so we have shorts uh, coming at the, closing his visit to um, Beijing, where Beijing has been very forthright in engaging and pushing back against those uh, accusations of overcapacity. We also have Xi Jinping going to France, where we can expect him to take a very similar message there. So all of these developments that we see in the U.S. really underscore the importance for Beijing in now managing this relationship with the EU and with European nations in the hope that this sort of momentum to target tariffs in the U.S. doesn't spill over to other U.S. allies. And Rebecca, it's no coincidence that Biden is going to make this trip when he's in Pittsburgh. He's going there for a campaign stop today. It's also where U.S. Steel happens to be headquartered, too. And he's trying to charm a lot of this union, a lot of the steelmakers, is he not? Yes, absolutely. That's a sort of, I think, important broader context. We're expecting him to address about 200 members of this union, United Steelworks. Now, that's symbolic importance here, too, because this is the union that has uh, opposed the acquisition by the Japanese uh, uh, firm Nippon Steel of of U.S. Steel. And so these tariffs, although relatively small, relatively targeted, fit into this broader agenda with Biden when it comes to trying to woo this really critical cohort of his electorate. 
Rebecca, thank you so much for breaking down that breaking news for us. That is Bloomberg's Rebecca Chung Wilkins. Again, just to reiterate, the Biden administration is going to be calling for higher tariffs on Chinese steel and aluminum during a campaign stop in Pittsburgh today. To the macro story, it's a series of high inflation readings and after which Chair Powell spoke yesterday. And bad news, he signaled that rate cuts might come later than expected. We'll need greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2%. The recent data uh, have clearly not given us greater confidence and instead indicate that it's likely to take longer than expected to achieve that confidence. Right now, given the strength of the labor market and progress on inflation so far, it's appropriate to allow restrictive policy further time to work and let the data and the evolving outlook guide us. The performance of the U.S. economy over the past year has really been quite strong. Come what may, we remain strongly committed to returning inflation over time sustainably to 2%. Let's bring in Bloomberg Sam Unstead on this. Sam, immediately after Powell, we saw a front end that went up to 5%. It's backed off of that this morning. But this was the one thing that the bond bulls could hang their hat on, that we have a Powell put that surely Powell will continue his dovish tilt and his propensity to cuts. Is that now out the window? It's certainly, uh, I think he's certainly pushed back a little bit harder than, than he has previously. Um, I think, you know, what he'd said actually had been front run by the market quite a mm. bit, you know, starting with the inflation data last week, then the retail sales data, had a whole host of Fed speakers as well over the course of the last week or so, pushing back a little bit further on those rate cut bets. Uh, what Powell said really has just underpinned a lot of that. And that narrative that we've, that we've had, as I say, that started with the inflation report last week, that fed particularly into Treasuries, has, um, has kind of already front run what, what the Chair Powell said yesterday. And Jefferson saying something similar yesterday, too, saying persistent price pressures means higher for longer. And, and Sam, this mm. all starts to get a bit awkward for the other G10 central banks, specifically the ECB and the UK. Lagarde has made it clear that they are ready to cut even if the Fed is not. Bailey yesterday saying something similar too. And now you have a Powell who's essentially solidifying this idea that they don't need to cut right away. And this is getting tricky. Yeah, it is. And, and actually, what you said there, Danny, is right. That, you know, that's something that's been coming up quite a lot more over the course of the last week is whether the Fed needs to cut at all. You know, mm. as those rates have been pared back, you know, the, the economy remains very strong. Inflation, they've had now three in a row, which have been relatively sticky. You know, that, that narrative has now been baked in. For the other central banks, you know, they are, you know, that, that's the other story that's kind of, uh, the, the other narrative that's going alongside the Fed is, is divergence from the Fed. And the question of whether they can cut before, I think they, they can, you know, the ECB or the Bank of England, certainly the, the inflation dynamics in each country would point to both of those banks cutting before the Fed. But, and, and I'd point actually to some really good stuff on the, on the Markets Live blog uh, here at Bloomberg in the, in the last week or two, that actually it's very rare for them to front run the Fed. And when they do, they do it very, very cautiously. And so, the central banks here, ECB and BOE in particular, may well cut first, but they probably still will remain very, very cautious in going any further than that until the Fed really starts to look at cuts. Of course, Sam, adding to the awkwardness is the fact we got UK inflation data hotter than expected, 3.2%, 3.1%. I mean, mm. bad time for Bailey literally just yesterday saying that they're kind of ready, or at least on the path to being able to cut. I mean, Bailey has made the stake before, has he not, Sam, where he says, oh, we've mm. turned a corner, things are getting better, and then the data says otherwise. I would, say, I, I would say the data does say otherwise, but it doesn't say it really, really loudly. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> the, the inflation data is um, certainly moving in the right direction. The really key concern is the services inflation data, which the BOE has been looking at very closely. The wage growth figure we also got on Tuesday, those two things will add to a, to a more cautious BOE probably mm. going forward. But actually, in terms of their forecasts, everything is not too far off. So, yes, it's, you know, June may be starting to, to no longer be in the picture for the first cut. But the second half of the year and a lot of, you know, what's come through my inbox today from people reacting to the inflation data right. is that the second half of the year does remain on. And inflation is going to keep going down. You know, it's, it's almost certainly going to hit the 2% target next month or the, or the month after that and then remain mm -hmm. around that kind of level. And so, although it, you know, on the, on the surface of it, it looks bad, I think you can see from the market reaction today even though you've had a pullback in bets on, on Bank of England cuts, that a lot of this has already been baked in through yeah. the Fed and through that, that kind of Sam. broader move. Sam, fair enough. Bloomberg Sam Unstead, thanks for joining us this morning. Okay, let's get to some of the other top stories that are trending on the terminal this morning. Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates are calling for maximum self-restraint as tensions between Israel and Iran boil. 
It's an unusually frank joint statement from the two Gulf countries. The comments come after a call between the Saudi Crown Prince and the UAE's president, warning of dire consequences of a wider war. ASML shares down after new orders missed in the first quarter. It's expecting weaker than expected sales in the second quarter before demand starts to pick up. ASML is the world's sole producer of equipment needed to make the world's most advanced chips. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission has blocked third-party messaging apps like WhatsApp on work phones of its own staff. The regulator has been cracking down on Wall Street over WhatsApp use. Another regulatory agency, the CFTC, is also considering a similar move for its employees. Coming up, shares of LVMH bounce back after uh, other luxury stocks post first quarter better than feared results. So what's the breakdown? Cognac is out. Leather goods at Louis Vuitton are in. We're going to have more on that next here on Bloomberg Brief. It's Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger. Chairs of LVMH are regaining its post-earnings losses amid hopes for a pickup on growth. For more, let's bring in Sweta Ramachandran of Artemis Investment Management, who joins us now. Sweta, this is, this is a case of if I had known the numbers before, I wouldn't have expected this to be the price action of shares higher by 3.8 percent this morning. You had sales growth that slowed on handbags and wine and spirits, the slowest pace since 2016, if you exclude the bump during 2020 lockdowns. So is this more of a normalization than a squeeze? How do you account for the market reaction? Yeah, I think the overwhelming sentiment really is one of relief because this had been widely flagged to be the quarter with the toughest comparisons for LVMH uh, on a quarterly growth basis. That normalization that you refer to, that certainly, you know, after the boom in 2021 and 2022, we'd started to see that normalization come through in 2023. Uh, it was expected to accelerate in 2024, which is certainly what's happening. But that path towards normalization is bumpier for some companies than it is for others. Uh, and LVMH really really has shown us uh, what it's like to have at least on the surface, I'm sure internally it's been quite uh, difficult uh, to achieve, but uh, externally it, it appears as if it's achieved a smoother and softer landing than many other companies in the sector are seeing. I mean, can you can you go over the cognac results? We're talking about this uh, a bit in the break because this has also surprised me because I would have figured cognac does poorly and it's a change in consumer taste, but it's not really that, is it? Right. So the wines and spirits number uh, on the face of it was quite a shocker at minus 12 percent. But that was explained as being primarily related to shipments because of the structure of distribution where it's not a retail business that uh, they have to make sales to wholesalers who then sell to the end consumer. And what's happening at the wholesaler level is uh, an element of destocking, which has been persisting for about six to nine months uh, and which accelerated actually in the first quarter of the year uh, against the company's expectations. What they did note was that end consumption, which is measured by a sellout to consumers, was actually flat in U.S. cognac for the first time in 18 months, and that wholesaler inventories are actually running very low. So if we do start to see a more material pickup in end consumption, that should come through also in shipments to wholesalers. Okay, so for Chinese demand, let's talk about this, because at home and abroad, Chinese demand, as we've been talking about, Sweda, for LVMH was good, rose 10 percent. And I have to say that feels somewhat shocking because the narrative has been one of wealthier Chinese not shopping as much because of unemployment looking particularly bad in China, housing slowdown, having that wealth effect and a downturn. So what does that narrative get wrong, which means LVMH can have that boost from the Chinese consumer? Yeah, so I think that's really very much about top down versus bottom up, where it is true. I mean, Kering produced a shock revenue warning last uh, month for the first quarter of the year, where they suggested that sales for Gucci, particularly in Asia Pacific, would be very weak, which again cast a pall on the entire sector. However, what's happening with Gucci is a very specific brand repositioning due to the designer change, which isn't necessarily indicative of what's happening everywhere. So it's clear that polarization in China with the Chinese consumer is actually 
accelerating and that certain brands are outperforming others, including uh, LV brands. The other element I think is that we've forgotten because China has been in lockdown for so long, but that prior to the pandemic, about 70% of what Chinese consumers were spending on luxury goods used to take place outside of China, which was of course all repatriated back home during the, the lockdown years. And that now the Chinese uh, tourists are tra starting to travel the world again, they're starting to look for deals in other parts of the world, which also explains why LVMH's sales in Japan were up so significantly in the mm. mid 30 percent range uh, in the first quarter of the year as more Chinese start to spend abroad than at home. So what did this idea, though, of Gucci and Caring not doing as well in China, China, this gets to this idea that you write about, that we are no longer in a rising tide lifting all boats luxury market anymore. It has been lumpy. Caring doesn't do well. Burberry doesn't do well. What's changed? Why is this the environment where when luxury shoppers are out, they're not shopping across the board? So I think in 2021, 2022, what we had was this sort of pretty indiscriminate boom fueled by stimulus checks, fueled by revenge uh, purchasing. And that has now normalized. We're going back to the historical clip, which is the industry growing at about 6 to 8% uh, per year, within which we have winners and we have losers. I think that's an environment that's uh, uh, that has definitely changed. And within that, brands that are resonating with consumers tend to win an outsized share of market growth at a time when the market itself is slowing down. Consumers tend to concentrate their purchases on top tier iconic brands rather than perhaps more experimental purchases, which again goes uh, to, to reward brands that have consistently invested in brand equity. If we look at the marketing budget of LVMH, their fashion and leather goods uh, segment spends as much on marketing as the entire annualized top line of Todd's, Ferragamo and Burberry put together. So it's hard, you know, it is hard for the other players in that context to even stand mm -hmm. a chance against this marketing firepower. Yeah, I mean, at least they're not lining in, uh, leaning into the mob wife chic. I think I think that's that's gone already anyway. We'll talk about trends some other time. So I think that's all we have time for. Sweat Ramachandran, thank you so much of Artemis Investment Management. Okay, coming up, yet again, Boeing under scrutiny. This time their safety record in two separate hearings on Capitol Hill. We'll have that for you next. This is Bloomberg. Two separate Senate hearings will bring Boeing safety issues under a microscope after a whistleblower's claim of poor assembly process. So that kicks off today. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Sid Phillips, who joins us for more. Sid, I mean, how many times are we going to have to do this? It's remarkable to look at the latest whistleblower's allegations, or at least what he proposes to say in front of the Senate, that there were well-telegraphed shortcomings in the company's safety culture. And so it's not a surprise. What else are we likely to hear in these hearings? Morning, Danny. So yeah, we, these, these two competing hearings are going to sort of put Boeing under the microscope yet again. Sam Salapo, the whistleblower, says that the 77 is not safe and he alleges that Boeing took shortcuts in the manufacturing of the 787. That's separate from the 737 MAX, which has been under lots of scrutiny. The 787 is Boeing's wide-body, long-haul jet and it's sort of key to Boeing's cash flow, uh, cash flow. And essentially, he's alleging that Boeing took shortcuts in the manufacturing of the process, and that's really structurally unsafe for the aircraft. And uh, Boeing has refuted those charges. They've said that they've done lots of studies and investigations, and they found nothing of substance in those allegations. So that's going to be an explosive testimony this morning. And separately, there's also an FAA report on the safety culture at Boeing that was pretty damning when they sort of released it. And the, the Senate Commerce Committee that's led by Senator Maria Cantwell is, is basically listening to testimony from experts on the safety culture at Boeing. So two ma major hearings for Boeing on Capitol, uh, Capitol Hill this morning, mm. and both of them aren't really going to be good news for the company. And, and, you know, obviously from just a PR perspective, it's disastrous yet again to have this thrust into the spotlight. But what potential outcomes, whether it be FAA or broader go government action, could come from a result of these various testimonies? So it's still to be determined what the whistleblower alleges in terms of 
being able to back up his claims. But the FAA said has, it is investigating the claims that he's made. And that will be sort of key to see what the next steps for Boeing and what the regulators will sort of come down on the 787 or what changes that they might recommend. But at the same time, I mean, Boeing's been under immense scrutiny uh, from both regulators, airline customers, and the general public. Mm. And this is not going to really help their case in terms of being able to say, everything's behind us, we're sort of moving on from here. This is going to add the spotlight again on Boeing's really, on their cultural issues and their safety issues and how yeah. they make their airplanes. So has, has Boeing said anything yet uh, uh, about these various panels or, or in reaction to what we've heard of what the whistleblowers are likely to say? And only about a minute here. Yeah, Bo Boeing has really said that uh, they've, dis they've disputed the allegations that the whistleblowers made. They've said that they've done extensive tests, they've uh, done extensive scrutiny, and they haven't found any merit in those allegations. At the same time, I mean, Boeing is in the midst of a massive change. The chairman stepped down, the, they replaced the head of their commercial aeroplane division, and the CEO, uh, Dave Calhoun, is due to stand down at the end of the year. So they are in the midst of all of these changes, and it's going to be just add more pressure to the company that they need to ramp up the pace of that. Sid, never a dull moment in your world. I think we're all looking forward to the day where it's only dull moments for the airline industry. Sid Phillips, thank you so much. Coming up on the program, we're going to dive into the technical analysis of the sell-off and earnings season. Jay Woods of Freedom Capital Markets is joining us on the economic data and the earnings ahead as U.S. stocks rebound after three days of selling. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger. Here's what you need to know. Another spike in U.S. yields as a hawkish Jefferson and Powell send the front end to 5%. So we've said at the FOMC that we'll need greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2% before it would be appropriate to ease policy. You know, we took that cautious approach and uh, sought that greater confidence so as not to overreact to the string of low inflation readings that we had in the second half of last year. Chip machine giant ASML plunges after first quarter orders disappoint and earnings season ramps up the Wall Street Titans battle rate jitters and geopolitical risks. Stability and calm finally this morning after three days of selling after yesterday the front end touching 5%. We heard from Powell but maybe it was geopolitics in Jefferson saying that persistent price pressures mean higher for longer, which really fueled the losses in the bond market. We gained today yields down by about two and a half percent. Sterling, for its part, it strengthens up four tenths of one percent. Cable at 124 after stronger UK inflation than expected. 3.2 percent versus 3.1 percent. Oops, that gets awkward for Bailey, who yesterday was talking about cuts. S&P also a rebound up two tenths of one percent. But the trend this month has been a sell-off in equities. Finally, it feels like U.S. stocks have succumbed to higher yields and geopolitical fears. So far this month, which keep in mind, has only been two and a half weeks, the S&P is down nearly 4%. If it holds on to these losses, it would be the worst monthly performance since September. Joining us now is Jay Woods, Chief Global Strategist at Freedom Capital Markets, who always has an eye on the charts. Jay, great to see you. Thanks for coming in this morning. Mm -hmm. So you write, this is the first time we didn't buy the dip all year. Why is this dip different from others? Well, this dip is different. You said it's the worst sell-off since September. And what happened in September? The 10-year started rallying towards 5%, and it's, it accelerated. What's happening now? The 10-year is starting to rise towards yes. 5%. It's accelerated, but where were we then? Where are we now? The S&P was just under 4,500. Now we're still above 5,000. So this higher for longer narrative is being digested. Mm. We're, we're holding levels, but this pullback, I know there are geopolitical headlines, yeah. and we, we're always going to have a headline for why we sell off, but let's think where we came. Uh, we just had 111 days above the 50-day moving average we're two days under. Okay, these things happen. That was the 12th longest streak since 1940. Uh, that's pretty impressive, longest since 2018. Two quarters of 10% growth in the S&P 500. So pullbacks 
are normal, they're healthy, and this could be just a garden variety pullback, or uh, it could be something more with the headlines. But I think the focus is on earnings. And right now, um, the earnings that we've seen, especially in the financials, they're not moving the needle higher, but they have been positive. We're seeing growth, so there are some positives here. And this could be a buy the dip uh, over the long term. But right now, no, we're not buying that. At what point do you get comfortable buying the dip? Because it's not exactly a full-scale de-risking. Jake, we're still just less than 4% from the all-time highs, that's by no means bad. So at what point do you say, okay, I can jump in, I can buy this thing? Yeah, well, I, I think you want to nibble now. I mean, look at where they're mm. buying stocks during this dip. Uh, th those magnificent stocks, the magnificent five stocks that have continued to do <laughs> well. your number. Yeah, I, I know. It depends what day it is. But right now, <laughs> you, you have the NVIDIAs, the Amazon, the Googles, the Microsofts that have continued to do well, and they're doing well in the face of, you know, some negative headlines. It's your favorites, the small caps that just, just you, can't Jay. get off the carpet. <laughs> I know. Uh, and, and I came in here and I, I loved it. But uh, given how rate sensitive they are, uh, technically, they, they never follow through. And we're going to chop yeah. for a while in, in, your, in your favorite little uh, small You're caps. You're breaking my heart, Jay. I, I know. But I'll forgive you. Okay. Going back to the banks, yes. it is remarkable, though, because when you see bank earnings that are fine, they're good, if anything, and they just get so punished. J.P. Morgan, its worst sell-off since 2020 yeah. after net interest income that wasn't upgraded. Bank of America fell 3.5% yesterday, mm -hmm. its worst day in nearly a year because of higher expenses. Yeah. Overall, the earnings were okay, but these little one-offs are really getting punished by the market. Yeah, we're focused on the negatives with so many positives in it. But look at J.P. Morgan. This stock had a tremendous run going into earnings. For that to take the next leg higher, it was going to take something extraordinary. And Jamie Dimon's not going to give you this rosy picture. Everything's fine. He's, you know, always looking at worst-case scenarios. And that's what leaders do. They, they want to see, okay, we did well. We're not going to spike the football. But... What's going to be the next one? And then Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs crushed it this yes. quarter. Uh, they all, uh, those metrics, Morgan Stanley crushed it. But price action isn't taking us higher. And as a technician, that's what has me concerned. Because the XLF made this full roundabout, broke out, and it looked like it was going to be on its way higher. It was up over 10% in the first quarter. Historically, when the XLF is up over 10%, it's up 15 out of its 25 times as an index, the ETF. It's finished higher on average by 21%. Those years, it's higher. So it has room to run. It just didn't get that catalyst this time. And that's what's got me concerned, because we didn't see the large cap financials take us that next leg higher. So we pull back and, you know, viable dips. Yeah, it's always scary when you're living through it. Oh, no, maybe this isn't your normal 5% correction. But if you look at the big picture, secular bull market, the higher for longer narrative is holding on. Uh, I think this is a viable dip. And when we hit 5,000, 5,001 is a 5% retracement. I think that's where you're going to see people come back into this market. So I think we're going to go sideways for a little while. Yeah. And people don't realize sideways is a direction. And you can make some money trading those sideways chops. But I was hoping the financials would take us higher. I'm watching the yeah. KRE. That's at its 200-day uh, moving average. And uh, it's an interesting thing as they report earnings this week and uh, later next. I thought earnings would be the thing that saves us. That sure, it's higher rates. Mm -hmm. But as long as the growth story is OK, we're OK. Yeah. Is that narrative challenged well, at the it, moment? It, it's not challenged. It's a narrative that doesn't always work out. You can have great earnings. I go back and just look at the poster child, NVIDIA. NVIDIA, back, I think it was last August, had its best quarter ever. The stock gapped up and reversed. It closed on its lows and then went sideways for five months. Their earnings have been fine. They've been spectacular. But... You know, it got a little tired. And right now, this market's a little tired. The broadening out theme is kind of slowing down because of those higher rates. Mm. Uh, Jay Powell threw some cold water on us yesterday. Yeah. Uh, almost put me to sleep just now <laughs> listening to it going into this. Jay, uh, that's sacrilege. You can't uh, say Powell's putting you to sleep. you got to be gripped onto every word. Uh, he's just got to bring a little more life or pep to the conversation. <laughs> but um, he, we'll see. Uh, to me, the PCE, uh, you mentioned Bailey said there could be a rate. Yeah. I, I think June isn't off the table yet because they focus on that number. And believe it or not, I believe they're looking for one cut before the election cycle really takes place, get it back to 5%. That last hike probably wasn't necessary, although three, three straight months of CPI ticking up slowly, that's, that's not what we need to see. But the PCE has remained slow and steady and in the right direction. So that will be the one besides the individual earnings to watch yeah. coming up uh, next week. Jay, you said a little bit of the quiet thing that we're not really allow allowed to say out loud, okay. but I kind of want to get into it. You said they're likely to cut before the U.S. election. Yeah. 
Do you think that they're not willing to start a cutting cycle during the U.S. election? Is there a political element to when they finally start to cut? Well, they'll never admit there's a political element. But of course, during election season, you kind of want to remain neutral so you don't have talking points on either side. Uh, And if you're going to do it, I think June is the time to do it. Yeah. Uh, there really is no reason for them to cut. Uh, even Powell admitted that so much ye- yesterday. But if things can stabilize, maybe maybe they just throw that trial balloon, a quarter point cut, mm-hmm. see what happens, and uh, go from there. Because the next big cut could be November, and that's election day. Right. So uh, yeah, I, I think you know they're not going to come out and say that. But we, we talk and you know on the floor and in <laughs> you know up on the desk and these are things that people Well, you're you're not the only one saying it, Jay, Mm. so very fair enough to bring it up. Jay, we're going to have to end it there. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Always appreciate your time. Jay Woods of Freedom Capital Markets. Okay, coming up, the tech story, shares of ASML getting hit, slower demand for the maker of chip making equipment. We're going to have more on that next. Shares of ASML are tumbling this morning in the European trade. First quarter earnings missed estimates, and it also hurt the analyst outlook for 2025. Shares down some 4%. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Chan Koch, who joins us now from Amsterdam. Chan, what happened? I thought this was the quarter for AI. This was the thing for demand. If you're going to be building AI chips, you need ASML in your life. So what disappointed? Well, it's fair to say it's a disappointing quarter for ASML. Uh, Shares dropped 6.4% and they're still down 4%. Um, Investors are not very happy because there is a big miss in its uh, order intake um, in the first quarter. And uh, that's led by a big drop in the demand for ASML's uh, most advanced extreme uh, ultraviolet or EUV machines. Um, EUV sales in the quarter uh, beat estimates, but orders for new machines uh, plunged to 600 million euros in the first quarter from 5.6 billion euros in the previous quarter. And that's due to the downturn in the chip industry. So China, this surprised me. China is still ASML's biggest market, even after you take into account all the export controls. So how much of this had to do with China slowdown? Or on the other hand, is Chinese demand still strong? Yeah, so the U.S.-led export controls um, on ASML sales to China kicked in uh, on January 1. And we see a little bit of an impact of those measures on uh, ASML sales to China. The sales dropped by 270 million euros uh, in the for, uh, first quarter from the previous quarter. Um, but China is, as you said, uh, still the biggest market for ASML. Um, and that's due to um, a drop in the share of other markets. Um, this shows that Chinese uh, chip makers are still buying older ASML machines um, as China tries to take over the market for kind of mature chips. Um, and it also shows that uh, um, other chip makers like TSMC and Samsung are not rushing to buy equipment from ASML. Finally, not, not lots of time here, but ASML, they themselves were optimistic about later this year and into 2025. Analysts seem to feel otherwise. Stiefel, for example, saying that the low order intake could put 2025 sales into question. Why is there this divide between what analysts say and what the company is saying? Um, Well, the company is basically um, saying that a lot of fabs are still being built around the world and uh, the constructions need to be completed before they can order from ASML. Um, And uh, huge subsidies are are being made available around the world uh, in Taiwan, in South Korea, in the U.S. um, um, to build facilities as countries seek to kind of safeguard um, chip supplies. Mm -hmm. And a lot a lot of these fabs will be ready uh, uh, for orders from the second half of the year. So ASML really expects to um, take off from next year in line with the industry's continued recovery from the downturn. All right, John, thank you very much. John Koch there joining us from Amsterdam to the finance sector. Morgan Stanley will cut about 50 investment banking jobs in Asia. That includes its biggest round of layoffs in China in years. Let's bring in Tom Metcalf, our Bloomberg finance editor. Tom, what do we know about these job cuts? And what does that tell us about Morgan Stanley's venture into China and their attempts to grow wealth management there? 
Yeah, it's a really fascinating dynamic. So as you say, about 50 job cuts in the region and 40 of those or so are going to be uh, effectively in China and Hong Kong, so Morgan Stanley's biggest market. And what it just really underlines is just what a difficult spot that market in particular is in. So obviously there's been the real estate troubles, the economy, at least by sort of China standards, has been relatively sluggish. And, you know, a lot of big Wall Street banks have, you know, bet a lot on kind of building out there. And it looks like, you know, for Morgan Stanley, uh, they're retrenching a bit. You know, they're not saying, hey, we're retreating out of China, but particularly on the deal making side, you know, these are big, big cuts. Uh, you know, something like 400 deal makers uh, in total in the region. So you're looking at, uh, you know, a big old chunk of people to leave with 50 going. Well, we also heard from Morgan Stanley yesterday. These were a strong set of earnings when it comes to wealth management, when it comes to trading. Does this run counter to that? Does this run counter to this narrative that their wealth management division is, is running at pace if there's some pullback in China? Well, I think the most interesting thing is one of the things the CEO said yesterday was investment banking, you know, he sees that as a really big bright spot. It was shown in the results. Um, and going forward, he expects there to be a big recovery there. So for me, it's fascinating, you know, specifically in China, that's obviously not what they're seeing or expecting to be the case. So there's a little bit of that sort of divergence there between, you know, Morgan Stanley probably talking about, you know, maybe the US market more than anything on the deal making front being very strong. But basically taking a very sort of uh, taking a step back, looking at China and going, no, we've you know, overexpanded there a bit. We need to cut back. So two different things going on there. And um, yeah, as you say, a strong set of results. So it's interesting you know, to follow up that with some, some news of cuts in China. Yeah. And also the news before that of some scrutiny over money laundering. It, it's, it's a what like a good news sandwich, bad on the ends, good in terms <laughs> of earning in the center. But for earnings as a whole, these banks are being treated very differently by this market. All it takes is one little miss. From JP Morgan, it's not upgrading their NII. For Bank of America, it's higher expenses and charge-offs. And that's enough for these shares to get punished. We're talking about Jay, to Jay Woods about this, the willingness of the market to punish these stocks. What do you make of that? The bumpiness, the lumpiness of how these banking stocks have performed this earnings season. Yeah, exactly. It's been fascinating watching the U.S. banks report, right? And you've really had that range. You know, Goldman Sachs did, did very well. Obviously, Morgan Stanley similarly well received. Um, but yeah, no, there's just this big discrepancy. And, and, you know, I think it's kind of on a case by case. You look at J.P. Morgan, how well its stocks performed and how, you know, that kind of incredible run of earnings it had. So perhaps not too surprising they're going to be pulling back a little bit when they do miss on, on certain things. Uh, and I, th I think the big thing is, you know, as you look at each bank, like what are investors focusing on? So for Goldman, look, that bet on the capital markets business makes a lot of sense for that particular firm. It's really paid off this quarter. JP Morgan, people are probably more closely looking at that NAI figure, and that is just a tougher environment for banks generally. And then you had Bank of America yesterday as well, right? And, and there, again, charge-offs, stuff like that, just giving people a bit of cause for concern in some cases. Tom, really appreciate it. That is Bloomberg's Tom Metcalf. Okay. Speaking of banking, J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon has been laying out his vision for the future of money in an AI world. Bloomberg Originals spoke exclusively with Dimon to kick off the circuit with Emily Chang's second season. She asked him about the opportunities and risks ahead. The best thing is be prepared for any business. Think When you think about risk, think about things that can go terribly wrong. Can you survive them? You know, it could be technology, it could be government regulations, it could be, uh, it could be the, literally the weather. If you're a restaurant, you know, that might close you down. If you, know, you, have, if you lose this week's business, you're out of business, you don't have enough cash. So you should think all that through. Bill Gates once said, banking is necessary, banks are not. To what extent could AI or fintech replace traditional banks? So I think, first of all, I remember him saying banks are dinosaurs. I spoke to him about it in 1997, and he, obviously he was dead wrong. He probably agreed to that. But, <laughs> but he's not wrong that technology changes everything. And if anyone is complacent or arrogant or think that because you have a big position today, you're going to have a big position tomorrow, that's a mistake. And, but then you have to define what is banking. Someone's going to have to hold the money. Someone's going to have to move the money. Someone's going to have to raise the money. Someone's going to have to do research you know, re, uh, about, around money. Those services will still be around. And, you know, hopefully we're doing it and using a lot of tech to do a better job at it. But I've always thought it's very possible that some tech thing, you know, disintermediates a piece of that. And I've been writing about, you know, big tech going to our business. We've got fintech, but we also have big tech. And they will embed payment systems in there. And some are going to white label banks, kind of what Apple did. Uh, you know, they have the right to do that. I'm not against that. I would be against unfair use of their position to dominate us in a business.
Well, Apple I'm, is I'm, is going deeper into financial services. So no Do you question. worry about the Bank of Apple? Well, I'm, I, we're going to compete, so they have a <laughs> they have a tough competitor. But you know, they hold money, move money. Yeah, they're a form of a competitor. You know, we also partner with them, but I'm very used to partnering and competing with lots of people. No. Existential threat? I don't think it's an existential threat, but I think if we were complacent about it, yes. You can watch the full episode of The Circuit with Emily Chang tonight. That airs at 6 p.m. ET in New York on Bloomberg TV or stream at 8 p.m. ET on Bloomberg Originals. The strength of the dollar finally starting to wane. It had been five days of a stronger dollar, most of G10 currencies. That changes this morning after yesterday getting a boost from Jay Powell and from Jefferson saying that it might be higher for longer. That is the dollar down about two tenths of one percent. But if we can get up the euro and sterling this morning, both of them stronger. A couple things happening here. UK inflation stronger than expected, 3.2 percent. The estimate was for 3.1 percent. Euro, this is interesting. Lagarde talking yesterday and still this narrative, this idea that they can cut soon. They're going through to that path. She says we're heading towards a moment where we have to moderate the restrictive policy that we have. However, Lagarde did say that the ECB needed to pay attention to the changes in exchange rates. Of course, weaker euro as a result of them cutting before the Fed. We spoke about this last week with various guests that it might cause this chain reaction, as Ludo from Allianz says, this chain reaction where a market overreacts. So it is something that Lagarde clearly is paying attention to, even if she says they are not dependent on the Fed. Bailey also said yesterday, talking at the IMF, that they can indeed be cutting before the Fed, but will the data let them do so? At this moment, it seems not. So cable at 124, euro at 106 as the Bloomberg dollar spot falls two tenths of one percent. OK, coming up, we're going to get you set up for your trading day and look at some of the market moving events here on Bloomberg. It's Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger. Managed Cranny is off today. Let's get you set up for your trading day on this Wednesday. The Fed will be issuing its beige book. That comes out at 2 p.m. Eastern. Then more Fed speak. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester will speak at 5.30 p.m. in Ohio. And the Boeing whistleblower testifies on Capitol Hill after the plane maker defended against allegations. Remember, we're also going to have Biden in Pittsburgh at the same time, too. We had breaking news at the top of the hour of considering more tariffs against Chinese steel and aluminum. In terms of the individual stocks moving before the opening bell, United Airlines shares are up. They had forecast better than expected profit this quarter, using some concerns about Boeing. And of course, the drama there continues today. Applied materials, they are falling after that ASML orders took a hit and a slowdown for its machines. Finally, Coinbase that is up in the pre-market trade, some 1%. Crypto.com is in the middle of a hiring drive and showing improved employment outlooks in the sector. Finally, for this overall market, it is finally tempting some buyers to jump in. 5% on the front end eases down. We're down by about 3.7 basis points. It really seemed like Jefferson yesterday talking about higher for longer was the fuel for a bond market sell-off. We're still around November highs for this bond market for the 10-year yield at 4.63%. We move lower by 30 basis points this morning. JP Morgan's client survey did show that investors net long by the most in three weeks as of Monday. So the buyers are coming back. Is it enough for a turnaround? That's it for the Bloomberg Brief. Surveillance, that's up next.